So what about yours? You've talked about our weaknesses. I didn't say weakness <laughs> at all. One of the things that you do provide in your clinic that we don't do is penile filler. Oh. So that I guess that is controversial. That Jerry is. took it right there. I know. I'm like, well, let's just go there, Jerry. I mean, no. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Beauty and the Brain, the podcast where we talk about all things aesthetics. I'm Dr. Chris Crowley. And I'm Jerry Drinkard, family nurse practitioner. Together, we own Skin and Tonic in Pace, Florida, and we're here today with our guest, Miss Danielle McGraw, who we've known for several years now and started out, we knew you as an ICU nurse. You worked yeah, in ICU Yeah, I've uh, known Danielle for more than 10 years now. God, time flies. So we started together working uh, when you were still in the ICU and I was doing ICU and anesthesia. And here we are 10 years later, both of us in successful aesthetic practices. So Danielle, for those of you who don't know, has a, a med spa in um, Fort Walton. It's a beautiful place, right? And so it continues to grow. You wanna tell us a little bit about your, your practice and yourself? Yeah, I have a med spa in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. Um, I have two different floors. Uh, one is basically just a spa. The other is all medical aesthetics. Um, started it four years ago and it has grown pretty quick. We do lots and lots of procedures just like you guys. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time there. We now have a full staff of about 14 people and you know, we are there every day of the week except for Sunday pretty much just like you guys. Um, I'm a, I have a doctor of nurse anesthesia practice and I have another injector with me, Brittany, and she is a family nurse practitioner and we do all of that. We also have a nurse who does a lot of our weight loss, you know, with us. And then of course, all of our estheticians and other staff. Did you ever think like 10 years ago, say when we first met and you were in ICU, did you envision being in aesthetics at all? No, never. No. So how did you how did you become interested in? in... Actually, you guys were my inspiration. So <laughs> that's there we nice go. to that's hear. <laughs> Botox parties, you know, we we. Had oh, fun. that's right. We we um yeah, we've known Danielle. She was actually one of the probably the, our first when we moved back to the yeah, area. She yeah. hosted yeah. some big Chicago. Botox parties when we first moved <laughs> yeah. back to the area. I, I totally forgot about that part of the, the story. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was kind of an interesting journey for us too. We didn't um, plan on this, but it. it I have to say, from my standpoint, uh, it's really a nice break from the hospital. It's a fun practice, and I know we have a lot of interesting patients, and we share those stories. So I think we're going to talk about some of those interesting things on the, the uh, show today. So I don't know what you can and, or what you're willing to discuss with your crazy <laughs> patients. So, and we say crazy in an endearing way. We refer to ourselves as... <laughs> I'm a crazy patient in my practice. Yes, so. I am Possibly too. Possibly the craziest yeah, in our practice would be Chris. <laughs> well, hmm, there's always got to be one. <laughs> That's true. So um, when you decided to go into aesthetics, um, you know, we get this a lot. So our listeners involved, not are a lot of patients, but we also have a lot of injectors and aspiring injectors out there that are just starting out their aesthetic um career. So obviously training is a big part of that. And so we need to be trained thoroughly on doing the procedures, not just, um, you know, uh, going to the hospital and showing up like we did for traditional medical jobs. So what's been one of the most surprising things is you've, you know, received training in aesthetics and tried to open your own business. What's been one of the biggest challenges? I think the business aspect is probably the most challenging part of it because, you know, any school that has to deal with medical does not really involve the business portion of it. So that was probably the most difficult for me. Um, training was great because I'm one of those people that I believe you can never have enough training. I'll take the same class over again because you might get some points from, you know, different perspectives, right? So you, you can, if I can take away one thing out of a training, it's worth it to me. Um, and we try to continue our training. Um, we're always going to conferences and training. Um, Brittany just got back from a cadaver course and I'm scheduled to do my second one in a couple weeks, you know, just staying up with what's new and, you know, all the newest techniques and safety, of course. Um, A4M has been great. I used Empire as well. Um, those two were pretty much where I did most of my training. And then, of course, private trainings. Um, those make a huge difference. Yeah, the cadaver courses are kind of, uh, they're cool. I think a lot of people kind of overlook that because we do our anatomy class in, yep. you know, nursing school or medical school. But it's a lot different when you go back at this stage. Uh, Jerry and I are actually teaching a cadaver class coming up. And um, the, the things we have to study to prepare for that. 
Oh, I think it's the thing about the cadaver course is I think it really makes you when you think you're experienced and you go to a cadaver course, you realize the like all the what ifs that could that could happen. Oh yeah. And so we continue to teach and train and go to all these courses and we learn different techniques from different injectors. And then you go to a cadaver course and most of the cadaver courses we um, that we attend or have taught have you know several different cadavers and the anatomy is never exactly the same on any of them. No. And so it does. It lets you know that you know there are true dangers out there. And and we talk about like safe procedures versus non-safe. And certainly some are more dangerous than others. But I don't think any of them come risk-free. And so it's pretty interesting to me from the, those cadaver courses because they really humble you. Oh yeah, and I mean in the way I looked at you know cadaver anatomy when I was in school, and not for aesthetics, you know, it was completely, I wasn't looking at a face like when you're in that class now and you're looking at the face and you're like, oh wow, you know. It, it, yeah, and it does humble you. I mean, it, it's kind of crazy. Just that little bit could change so much if you're injecting wrong, you know, yeah. What's been the most challenging thing, uh, skill-wise, that you've had to learn in aesthetics? Hmm. That's a good question. You want Jerry to answer that one? Yeah. I know his answer. What What is your answer? The most Jared? challenging what do you procedure. Think my answer is, I think you're wrong. <laughs> I would say PDO threads. That's what I was gonna say yeah. for Jerry too. <laughs> Am I right? I th I th yeah. I, I, I think my I think the biggest challenge is PDO threads and correction of other people's or even ours. I shouldn't say other people, but correction of other work because it's always hard to get back to what you originally started with. We've had a lot of corrective work that I've done for PDO threads. Um, I think all of us and any injector listening, like lip migration or overfilled or Danielle and I share a few patients that like have just been some challenges, you know? And so I think um, certainly threads, I don't make any bones about that and corrective work. That's probably my biggest challenges. What did you think I was going to say? I had no idea what you were going to say. <laughs> I was going to pick PDO threads yeah. too for, for him. I'm, a, I'm pretty vocal about that. Yeah. I mean, I do think they're a challenge. And I always say from even an instructional standpoint, I think that the barb threads are one of the most challenging things to teach. And I think in terms of skill, it's one of the harder things to acquire. And, you know, all of us do PDO threads and you do a phenomenal job. I've seen some of your work. and But I know that that's, a, you know, to me, that was a, a challenge. I didn't know if there was something you found more challenging than that. You so. know, I think the challenge with PDO threads, though, is, you know, it's hard to teach them because it's more of a feel, you know, and, a, and just a vision, I guess, you know. So if you don't have that, you can't explain to someone how to put it in. You, I mean, you can, honestly, but yeah. So that was that was a little harder. When I was taking the first course I did in um, Colorado for him, you know, he's explaining it to me and then he's doing it. And I'm like, well, I need to put my hands on that because I don't, you know, you can explain all day long, right. but I have to feel. But I think mine is probably more of the correction um, and telling patients that no, you don't need that done. Um, <laughs> And it's not because I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm very assertive. I can, I can say it, <laughs> but I always worry about, you know, what's the underlying cause here? Like why, why do you want your lips bigger when they're obviously already too big? You know, so by me telling you no in this, you know, is it gonna go psychologically a little different than what I'm thinking, you know? So I, I always, I do that, I struggle with that. And then having to, you know, dissolve patients and not, take away everything because they're freaking out, you know? So I, I find that very challenging, honestly. When Danielle said she's assertive, she is the Botox bitch. For those of you <laughs> that don't know, she is the Botox bitch on the Instagram. Yeah, so that's, that's her just, handle on just, Instagram. Just if if you want to follow her and we'll put that in the, the link. So you but I do think it. that that's, that's a huge challenge for all of us is talking patients out. And we're, we're probably all pretty good at that, that is talking patients out of more things than we actually talk them into. And I think that as an industry as a whole, that's a, that's a, a, a fine line that you walk because we also know when we talk them out of something, when they leave us, they're Googling or finding some other provider that will do it. We typically see them back because then it's a correction issue that, that you know, we just talked about. So, um, yeah, the, the personality side of this business is a, certainly a challenge. So what about yours? You've talked about our weaknesses. 
I didn't say weakness at all. <laughs> I said what was the most challenging thing to learn, skill to acquire. Um, I would also, I mean, I agree with PDO threads. I do a fair number of those now, and so I, I like that, And um, but it took a long time, and I think that's where the training comes into play. And so even now when I'm talking to new injectors, um, I'll, I'll say that the first you know, one or two classes with PDO threads is really to learn about what the PDO threads do, what's their mechanism, where are they ideally placed? But there's no way to get that, um, to get proficient at that without getting your hands in and doing it. And that's where you've got to go back to your practice, you've got to have models, you've got to do it, and you know, either do preceptorships, private training, something where you can really get the numbers under your belt because just taking a class like we often do with some of the other procedures, it's not something that you can easily do one class and then go and be an expert at that right away. Okay. It's just gonna take a lot of practice. So I agree with that and you know um, lasers are also or were a challenge for me we have a lot of devices in the practice now but years ago when we first started I think we um, kind of one of our bad business decisions and um, we got led down this pathway by one of the reps and we bought uh, you know a co2 laser that we couldn't quite adjust the way we wanted to and it was very aggressive it didn't match our patient population. And I got scared of it then because we really had some aggressive treatments and although the patients had pretty good uh, results overall, we didn't have any kind of bad long-term consequence, it scared me. And so a lot of the things that we do now with combination therapies where we're combining lasers with other treatments, I shied away from it for a long time. I think it was a challenge to understand the wavelengths, where do these lasers work, what depth of tissue are they, causing their mechanism of action, whatever it may be. So that took me a while. I think it, that, you know, to really understand this is where this laser is working, um, it looks easy now. And I look back on it, I'm like, I don't know why it was a roadblock for me, but that actually was a challenge uh, years ago. So, and I continue to learn now, right? There's still things that I'm like, I don't know, I get a little bit worried about different things here and there. We're always learning. So. Well, it's ever evolving too. I mean, the machines just are crazy. You know, it's constantly something new. So yeah. Well, I think we, I think the machines evolve, and I think we evolve as well as as injectors and um, providers, and because you can't really train someone to have an eye for it. And after you've treated so many of these people, you you realize what what's going to happen when you treat certain things, and all these multimodal therapies, you learn how they work together and complement each other. And so I think that that's a, one of the things that's really hard to teach someone that like a new student. There's a lot of challenges. So is there uh, something that you either want to talk about or something that you offer in your practice that you would consider controversial? So for me, I'll give you my example. You think about it. And I know that's a hard question just to jump right into. But, you know, for us, a lot of people won't do nose filler. We know that filling noses is a high risk procedure. You can have blindness as a result. You can have forehead necrosis as a result. Um, and so uh, I do that in our practice, but I'm the only one of us, and we do it kind of for risk management. Jerry's very proficient and could do anything that I can do and probably do it even better than I can. But um, we kind of look at things that we're all really good at and that we enjoy doing, and that's one of the things that I would say some people find controversial and they won't do it. And they just say, and I think that's fine as an injector to know your limits and know what you're kind of offering that may be a little bit controversial. And we do some forehead filler, so that's also controversial. So whether you put filler in some of the glabellar lines or forehead, it's a higher risk area. But um, I would say it's something that we, we do offer. We educate the patients on it. We don't do these things without saying that, yeah, this is controversial. And some people will tell you they're not gonna do it for X, Y, and Z. So for me, I would think that's what, we, what I do in the practice. So do you offer anything that you consider edgy or controversial? I do the same thing, and I'm the only one who does you know, nose threads and nose filler, and I usually do a combination of both. Um, and I, I will also do glabella and some forehead, you know, depending on the patient. I, I tend to weigh them toward PDOs, you know, if I think it can correct, but every product has its limitations. So again, multimodal, I, I use a lot of stacking of things, you know, just to get good results. But yeah, I, I explain to the patient ad nauseum, you know, how complications. And of course, you just do the best and the safest practice that you can do, you know, cannulas and, 
and such and you warn them of si signs you know when you're going home if you see any of this you call us immediately that kind of thing and I think it's just being prepared and knowing how to fix your complication and when I've trained anyone that's what I tell them if you're going to do a procedure you better know how to get yourself out of it if, if there's a complication if you don't then you shouldn't be doing the procedure yeah I think that's great advice and I, I always say I, I really do um, I don't just say this lightly but I feel that we're pretty fortunate in our area. We have a lot of really good injectors. We have some new people, but I, I think that we have a lot of um, established good practices that people can call on for resources. Agreed. And when I travel all over, you know, for um, Empire and teach these courses, I realize in certain geographic regions, there are kind of gaps in these resources. And so some people are kind of out there on their own. So it's scary for them when they're starting. So. Um, for us, it's always been nice to know that, you know, if we have something going on, we can call you, we can call a friend and say, hey, let's get some, how would you handle this? Because if you do enough injectables, you will have some complications from time to time. Yeah, that's with any medical procedure, in my opinion, you know. Yeah, yeah I completely agree. One of the things that you do provide in your clinic that we don't do is penile filler. Oh. So that I guess that is controversial. That's, I was going to say that 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 <laughs> Jerry is, took it right there. I know. I'm like, well, I, let's just go there, Jerry. I, mean, no. I, I think it, I think it's slightly controversial, and, and so when I um, if I have someone that I think is possibly a candidate, like I'll I'll send them your way because we do like sex, several sexual health procedures at the clinic, and that's just one that I haven't tried. So have you had or seen like problems or any kind of issues or? No, I've not had any problems at all. So let me just stop before we get into it for people who are listening who don't exactly know what we're talking about. So we do offer uh, treatments in our practice for erectile dysfunction, and so we focus more on the performance and function issues. So um, we offer the performance P wave, and that's where we're doing shockwave therapy along with PRP, vacuum assist therapy, and maybe some sort of medication to really help with erectile function. What you're specifically talking about is more for aesthetic enhancement. So if you want a bigger, more girthy penis, Danielle is the expert on this, so she can tell us how we can accomplish that. But that's what um, we're talking about now is using some sort of filler in the penis to give it an increased size or increased girth. Yes, and to adjust cosmetically too. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. some people have a naturally, it's not even and they don't like it or, mm -hmm. you know. I've never, I've not had, knock on wood somewhere, a complication with it, but again, cannulas, you know, being very safe and, you know, making sure they know the risk. Right. And that is a very important area to most men. So, yeah, you know, they, absolutely. they usually know the risk before they even come in, you know, and so if it makes someone feel better about themselves, I'm, I will train and I will learn to do it. And, you know, so I've been doing that about two years now and we've had a lot of people come in for it and, you know, they like, it works, it does well. How many vials does it take on average to? So we really, it depends on Yeah, the size, on, what on you're the working size. with, yeah. right. Um, and so, you know, I've, I think four is the least I've ever done, um, you know, to start out with. And I'm a minimalist at most things anyways. So, you know, you've really got to talk me into going the extra mile to get it really big, but, um, I make them come back, you know, I, I'm like, it's not going to hurt you to wait, you know, four weeks and then let's come back in and reassess. Um, now are you using hyaluronic acid fillers? Or? Yes, okay. I use hyaluronic acid. Um, and that's the other thing, you know, they have to understand that you, you really can't have sex for a little while. And um, I've had patients not comply with that and then they come back in. And so that is a complication um, yeah. and it's uneven and yeah. so. Dissolving. How long do they have to abstain or how long do you recommend? So I recommend two weeks. Um, this guy waited about three days. And <laughs> <laughs> he was ready to, to try ready out the to news. Go. <laughs> this is, but I mean, yeah, then it had to be dissolved and then redone. And, you know, and that's painful. Dissolving and hurts. And very pricey. I mean, yeah. that's a that's an expensive mistake for uh, someone to make. 100% because I think he had six syringes. So, yeah. Well, and that's the thing that I kind of want the listeners to know that, um, you know, we've looked into it. Jerry's wanted to bring this into the practice. We've talked about offering this. We haven't started doing it yet. But one of the things that I know from all the things that, that we've learned about it is it's not one or two vials. So when people go down this pathway, you said four, and that's kind of what I've heard is a minimal of six. And if you really need to add significant girth, it's going to be even more than yeah. that. So, you know, People do need to be aware of that and have it in their budget when they're seeking out this therapy. And, you know, ask the experience of the provider. Like we said, we certainly um, refer to you because you do a lot more of this than we do at this this time. So I think it's reasonable for patients to ask, 
you know, how long have you been doing this? How are you going to handle the emergencies? Ask those questions. Don't be well, shy we've about it. We've talked about before, like even on like some of the episodes of Beauty and the Brain, we've talked about for for our listeners to not be afraid to vet your provider. Like I think I think all of us that's, um, as humans, should we go to any physician or medical provider should feel comfortable to ask like what f- qualifies you to take care of me? Yeah, exactly. And can you fix it if something does go wrong? So. Yes, I know I agree, and I mean I think people now are very, um, you know, they're internet savvy, so they search, they look, yeah. they look at reviews. They have a lot by the time we see them. Oh, hundred um, percent. And I, I mean, I think that's good in yeah. some ways and in some ways not so good. Um, you so know, what are your thoughts on, on social media and the internet and the way that it's influencing kind of what we view as ideal beauty? That's a hard one because now I feel like we're in the world of, um, you know, filter. Everybody's got a filter on. Um, you take a selfie and it's not you. It's crazy to me. Um, you see these girls who are already beautiful and then I see their post on you know Facebook Instagram or whatever it may be and then they come into my office and I'm like you don't and I'm going back and forth like that is that person right you know (laughs) and I've, I've asked them before like why do you need a filter you know like you're already gorgeous like what well why does it matter if it makes me feel better and I'm like okay I see that point too but why, why as a society do we feel like we need to have a filter? And I know that sounds funny coming from like us who, you know, this is what we do for a living, right? We, we enhance people's beauty, but um, I, we enhance individual beauty. And I feel like these filters and stuff make everyone look the same. And that's what I don't like. I, I just find it, you know, interesting because, um, you know, a personal story, um, I've had to do some new headshots recently and obviously trying to find time to go to a photographer and do all the things you need to do. It's time consuming. And so there's some AI software now that will do these things for you. And so you literally just take some selfies of your whatever. You got to submit so many selfies and AI will generate hundreds of headshots, change your clothes, change your hair, all this for a very low price. And so I get all these headshots back and I'm showing Jerry and Sierra. But the interesting thing was trying to pick them out because I'm like, does that really look like me? Or is that the version of me that I want to look like? Because it's similar enough that it does resemble you, but you definitely can see that some of the AI software, so it's almost like a filter that's created these ideal images and it does smooth your skin. It does make your eyes pop. And I love it. I'm looking at it and I'm like, that's the one I want. Jerry's like, but like, you have no pores on there. I'm like, yeah, I don't want like, any pores. He, he, earlier, he's like, I want to bleach my eyes. So they turn that color. Yeah, it's like a, they're a lighter color. And I'm like, I love that. How can I like make my eyes that color all the time? We can. There's a process up in New York where the care what is it, Keratado or whatever it is? Yeah, you can change the color of your eyes. Yeah, and, and so we can do all these things. So I agree, it's kind of a hard, it's a fine line as to what is going to be enhancing natural beauty and what's artificial. Um, and I also think it's interesting kind of this perception drift because over time we start to look at these things and it starts to look normal to us. And so things that when you filter yourself over and over or when you look at the way You know, we hold our face a certain way when we look in the mirror. When people put their makeup on, they hold their face the same way every time. When I look at Jerry, I have the same face that I look at. And he's like, I can't tell because you're making that crazy face again. (laughs) And so we hold our face in a certain way. We filter ourselves and that we think we look okay, but that may not be the rest of the world. Probably the rest of the world doesn't care. I think my view is that we're harder on ourselves than anybody else. 100%. We're our own worst quit critics. I think the, the social media and the filters, like you were talking about, like um, we want, we're in the business to make people really feel better about themselves. Like they may come in just to have a glabella treatment or just to have like a little lip flip or something like that. But these filters, I don't know that they truly make people feel better about themselves. That and ten X mirrors, I think those are like <laughs> sent straight from hell. Yeah, but, agree. Um, but you know, I don't know that at the end of the day, if filters truly make people feel better. I think in that moment when you look and think, I can be that pretty. I think it does, but at the you know at the end of the day, I think it really f- impacts people's self esteem, and um, and it will make people go overboard with the things that we do, trying to achieve that. Agreed. And, like we we see it a oh, lot. A lot. Yeah, and I think that's one thing about all of us being in business for a really long time is we're a lot more comfortable at telling people no. 
in the beginning, you wanted to do everything. And I can remember feeling um, pressure when patients would want something done and I would want to really make them happy. So I was almost forced or had my hand twisted to do that. Whereas now I'm like, no, that's really not best for you. That's not natural. And we do have some that are unnatural that I always say, like, I think if you have enough patients out there, once you get several thousand under your belt, if you want to have a few that look crazy here and there, then go for it. But that's more body modification than exactly. things that we're really doing in aesthetic medicine. And so if that's what you do out of the gate for everybody from the beginning, um, then you're gonna be, you know, that's gonna be what's known, what your practice is known. Yeah, that's your hashtag, right? right? Like that's your social media brand right there. And that was not what I ever wanted my social media brand to be, so. So what do you think about cosmetic procedures or these procedures we do for minors? Do you provide care for minors? Um, I don't. Um, I made my own daughter wait until she was 19 years old to you know, get a little bit of lip filler and a lip flip done. So I do not treat minors. I, even with parental consent, yeah, I mean, obviously you'd have to have that, but um, I just. Yeah, we get asked, I think most frequently for lips. That's where a lot of these teenagers are, are wanting enhancements in lips and, and we don't. Um, we don't provide that service either. We've done a few things for more symmetry. So like a dog bite that's scarred on the lip where we've done a little bit of correction for that. But even that could be controversial, whether people would want to do that or not. I, I'm okay with that aspect. You know, if it's something that like cleft palate or something yeah. where we can come in and just help the person feel a little bit better about uh, quote unquote, you know, deformity, so to speak, you know, scarring and stuff, it does, calls asymmetry and everything else. Um, so that I would be a little more And I'm guessing too, I don't want people listening that may be down in your area around Fort Walton to think, um, you probably also offer treatment for like acne for minors, I would assume. Oh, yeah, yes, we, we do We do that, I'm not acne, even thinking, yes. I'm thinking, talking more of the injectables. I'm, I'm thinking so. injectables too. Yeah, yes. I, I would make sure that we're on the same page, but I don't want people to think like acne yeah. and that kind of skincare stuff of we all offer for, yeah. for teens. Well, I think the filter, like that, the filters started four and five years old because you think about like the Instagram filters or Snapchat filters they where you can play with them. You know, you can, they can play and put dog ears on them or unicorn horns. Oh, my so, five year old loves it. Yeah. yeah. So, th so those filters and you know, your perception of yourself, it starts, but it's pretty amazing too, how many parents are willing to, I don't have kids, so I can't say what I would do. Um, but it's pretty amazing how many parents are willing to say, yeah, it's okay. I'll sign for it. So I guess it's, we just each as providers have to like decide what we're comfortable doing. I guess my biggest thing is, um, you know, I, I don't want to alter a young person's self image, right? They already have so many issues as a, you know, as a teenager growing up. I mean, I remember it that long ago, but you know, you just, you have things you don't like about yourself and then society makes it worse. I feel like if we start treating all of these young kids to make them look like the ideal person or the Instagram filter or, you know, Kim Kardashian or whoever they're trying to look like, you know, we're, we're not doing anything good for them in the long run because it's just going to perpetuate. And it's, I don't know, for me, I don't think it's good. And I have two daughters. So but when you get our age, change that shit. Oh. Like if you want it done, do it. Well, yes. Oh, no. <laughs> Exhibit A, B, and C. Yeah, right? No. <laughs> and I tell my kids that all the time. I'm like, you know what? When you get to where mom is, then you can do whatever the hell you want. Until then, mm -mm, not going to happen. Well, so, we yeah. appreciate you having you here today. It's been fun. and well, thank it, you guys for having fun me. fun continue on and on. So, Yeah, we could talk all night long. Uh -huh. So yeah. Danny has given us the time signal that it's time to wrap it up. So, yeah. Thanks again, uh, Danielle. So, uh, you guys, thanks for tuning in and listening this week. Uh, stay tuned next week for another episode of Beauty and the Brain. See you soon. <laughs>